The U.S. president looks east to re-establish America as a Pacific nation. But has Barack Obama's Asian tour rubbed China the wrong way, challenging Beijing's ambitions in a region it sees as its backyard? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Hazem Seeker. The U.S. president has wrapped up his nine-day tour of Asia looking to reassert American influence in the region. And not surprisingly, perhaps China, the rising Asian power, was not happy about it. Obama met the Chinese leader Hu Jintao on Saturday on the sidelines of an East Asian summit held in the Indonesian island of Bali. They reportedly talked about the Chinese currency and economic issues along with other U.S. interests in the South China Sea. Obama started his tour last week in Hawaii, where he announced the Trans-Pacific Partnership, a free trade area that will unite nine nations. I want to emphasize that uh, the Asia-Pacific region is absolutely uh, critical to uh, America's economic growth. We consider it a top priority. Uh, and we consider it a top priority because we're not going to be able to put our folks back to work and grow our economy. Uh, and expand opportunity unless uh, the Asia-Pacific region is also successful. Well, China was welcome to join, but it would have to deliver economic reforms it may at this stage find unpalatable. Now, then he moved to Australia, where Obama announced the deployment of 2,500 troops to Darwin, not too far from the South China Sea. And these rotations, which are going to be taking place on Australian bases, will bring our militaries even closer and make them even more effective. Uh, we'll enhance our ability to train, exercise, and operate with allies and partners across the region. Uh, and that, in turn, will allow us to work with these nations to respond even faster to a wide range of challenges. While President Obama was in Australia, his Secretary of State was in Manila, warning China, without naming it, not to intimidate its neighbors. Any nation with a claim has a right to assert it. But they do not have a right to uh, pursue it through intimidation or coercion. Well, China is involved in a territorial dispute over the South China Sea. These are the oceanic claims of the Philippines, Malaysia, Vietnam, Taiwan and Brunei. And this, marked with the red line, is what China thinks it owns. Well, China wants to discuss its territorial disputes with each country individually. But on his last leg in Bali, President Obama said he wanted to deal with the disputed South China Seas at the East Asia Summit with 18 nations, including China, around the table. It's a move that would weaken China's negotiating position. Well, joining us now are our three guests to talk more about this. In Birmingham, we have Scott Lucas, a professor of American studies at the University of Birmingham and editor of the news website EA Worldview. In Brussels, Jonathan Holslag joins us. He's head of research at the Brussels Institute of Contemporary China Studies. And in Hong Kong, we have Simon Shen, an associate professor of international relations at the Hong Kong Institute of Education and Chinese University. Good to have you all with us. Uh, Simon Shen, if I could start with you. Given what's happened over the last week, how would you uh, characterize uh, U.S.-Chinese relations at the moment? Well, uh, from Beijing's perspective, it's quite clear that it's a conspiracy or encirclement of China by the states. Uh, indeed, way before the conferences, we have heard um, from different researchers from China. They were very alert of the uh, recent attempts of the states to um, encircle China. And they think it's an obvious intention to uh, check and balance against the rise of China. Um, so generally speaking, um, they wish to do something against the American advancement uh, so that um, we observe the recent trends. And then I expect um, some Chinese as well advancement or candy balancing would be a weakness in the future. Scott Lucas in Birmingham, um, what do you think is, is part of the motivation here for um, uh, President Obama in taking a tougher line towards China? I mean, we said that this is, uh, we were told that this is a, an attempt to reestablish American uh, foothold uh, in Asia and reestablish American influence there. But is he, is he also looking towards his reelection uh, prospects uh, next year and, and the criticism that he's gotten from uh, his Republican opponents that he's been too soft on China? I think there's a lot of motives here, and they go beyond just a, uh, an American strategy of encirclement. For example, the Americans have had a long time strategy of what's called force projection. That is to deploy smaller uh, forces around the world into a series of bases. That was sort of 
dis deflected by Iraq when they got bogged down by Iraq. But now that the Obama administration thinks, well, we're coming out of Iraq, that strategy of deploying around the world, not just in, uh, in Asia, but in Africa and in the Middle East, they're trying to get back to that. But you're quite right to bring up the domestic context. First of all, the American Pentagon, the military, they want to protect their budget at a time of recession. So to do that, they play up China as a threat. And they say, well, if China is a threat, you can't cut our funding. Then you have the American Congress, which quite frankly is looking for anyone to, to take a shot at right now, you know, the idea of restoring American might. And you have Obama going into an election year where he, he doesn't want to appear weak. And all of that together means that while the Americans may not deliberately be being pursuing encirclement, I don't think they are, they're winding up on this strategy to project power, which can have the unfortunate consequence of, uh, let's say, raising Beijing's suspicions. Jonathan Holslag, is this a policy of uh, U.S. encirclement towards China, be it deliberate uh, or not? Well, in many ways, it's a return to normality. I think it is um, uh, the usual pattern that if a, a power rises, that it creates a lot of um, uh, reactions and also resistance. So that is certainly going on, but it's definitely complicated, as my colleague says, by a lot of domestic politics. And that goes for the U.S., but also has a big impact on how, how all this is received in Beijing. A lot of leaders there feel that they are under growing uh, domestic pressure, not the least uh, from uh, hardliners and con conservatives within the communist party to send strong. And I think this is particularly going to make this a very tricky, awkward um, uh, exercise to keep uh, their, their, their head school and to deal with this counterbalancing in a, in a, moderate, uh, in a moderate way. Simon Shen, are, are, are both sides uh, playing a somewhat dangerous game here in, in that they may be perhaps fanning the flames, the nationalist sentiments uh, in both countries, in the United States and uh, in China? Well, uh, in China, we have uh, continuously witnessed a rise of nationalism in recent years. Uh, even though the public have no formal say in the uh, policy-making process, uh, the government do have to pay attention to the uh, public outcry. And since the Belgrade embassy bombing and the uh, Sino-US biplane collision incident, um, the trend of escalated nationalism can be summarized from time to time. So. Uh, from my opinions, um, it is almost um, impossible for the government to ignore the public, and then the public is overall um, nationalistic. Uh, regarding the United States, uh, we haven't witnessed a similar mode of the rise of nationalism in the same scale. However, um, the presidents and the Congress and the politicians do have to respond to the uh, domestic discontent towards um, the declining U.S. status at the same time. So what I'm worrying is that um, the realist on both sides might be the one who make the agenda, and as a result, the two sides could be clashing in the long run, especially in China. Uh, we have heard of um, different offensive realist reaction from time to time. For instance, they think, well, we have to have a bottom line. We can't let the Americans to uh, set uh, as our backyard. So they have to do something to defend uh, the islands, uh, the sovereignty, and then the conflict regions so that um, the Americans can know the bottom line of China. And this is the strategy that had been proposed by the realists from time to time. And then this time, this year, this month, it is the major strategy uh, proposed by uh, the uh, official scholars uh, in hope of uh, proposing a counter response towards the American advancements. Jonathan Holzweig, it's, it's been said that uh, this may the beginning, be the beginning of, a, of a, a type of Cold War between the United States and China. And I use the term Cold War very loosely because obviously uh, the world now is a lot different from what it was uh, a generation ago. But do you, do you share that view? Well, absolutely so. Um, and I think we have now a new stage of rivalry unfolding itself over, over different layers. Obviously, the world is getting more nervous about China's military modernization, which stirs a lot of reactions in neighboring countries and now, of course, also the United States trying to keep its end up. But it's also more. It's about um, the fact that the West is overall in a very painful economic adjustment crisis that has been, to some degree, the consequence of the, the shift of economic power towards, uh, towards the East. And you will also also see there, uh, at that level, a lot of very negative reactions towards China's growth um, in terms of um, uh, protectionist sentiments, but also in that regard, interesting to see what is happening with the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which could be uh, seen as a sort of move of the U.S. to deal with, uh, with China's growing uh, economic cloud. I don't really think that the return of realism uh, to um, uh, uh, Washington and Beijing uh, is the main issue. What my worry is mostly is that realism is going to relapse into 
to more nationalism on both sides of the Pacific, and that this way will, will make it much more difficult and awkward to uh, keep a lid on, uh, on tensions and escalating frictions. We'll talk a little bit more about this uh, Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership trade uh, deal that you touched on there, uh, Jonathan Holzlager, in just a moment. But I want to turn back to uh, Scott Lewis, if I can. Uh, Scott, you mentioned earlier the, the uh, uh, domestic pressures that President Obama is under um, at the moment as far as taking a tougher stand with, his, with China. But is it also economic concerns in that while Europe is bogged down with its debt crisis, while the United States is suffering its economic problems, China de uh, the United States rather desperately needs another market to turn to. Asia is the area where there is still uh, growth. So it's, it's really about uh, trying to look for growth that will spur the U.S. economy. Yes, but I think that's why this is not a Cold War. I think this, in fact, sort of is the other side to confrontation. The fact is, is that the U.S. needs not only Asia, they need China in terms of this uh, uh, to try to encourage economic growth. You have a type of interdependence economically that was not present 30 years ago. And you not only need China economically to try to pull out of recession to the point where people are talking about China supporting, say, the Eurozone and getting out of its crisis, you need China diplomatically. You need it on crises like the North Korean crisis. You need it really on Asia-Pacific questions that go beyond specific U.S.-China confrontation. And it's that type of realism, if you really want to talk about realism, that I think is the counterweight that mitigates against, uh, say, the domestic pressures to, to really show the fist to China. All right, let's talk a bit more about some of these specific issues then. Simon Shen, I want to put this to you. The, the Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership uh, that we talked about uh, earlier, this, this proposed trade deal between the United mm -hmm. States and several uh, Asian nations, not including China right now, and the requirement that they want is uh, certain guarantees about uh, how uh, China will uh, deal with its currency and, and issues of, 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 of trade policy and intellectual property rights and so on. What kind of a message does that send to China? Because there are many in, in your country who will say that this is somewhat uh, talking mm -hmm. down to, to China. Will they see it that way? Uh, I think most of the Chinese regard the TPP as something that is targeting obviously against the Chinese uh, because the conditions that they have imposed are, are the ones that cannot be met um, by China in the short run. Um, more, than as, uh, more so is that um, the Chinese government is trying to or, or was trying to uh, do something uh, through the uh, Sino-Japanese-Korean collaboration uh, by establishing a free trade, a free trade zone uh, among the three countries. And then the uh, negotiation is always on the way. But at the same time, uh, the U.S. is proposing a TPP so that the two agendas would be uh, offsetting uh, one another. So from the Chinese point of view, uh, if without the TPP, the Chinese influence would um, eventually spread through the whole area of Asia Pacific. Uh, but with this TPP, then the Asian countries can have choices right now. So they can choose either the side with the state or with the Chinese. So uh, from the Chinese point of view, it's a very obvious intention of the U.S. to kind of balance the rise of China in the region. Jonathan Holslake, you look like you were uh, nodding into an agreement uh, to some of that. Is there a sense then uh, that China perhaps needs to, to play by the rules a little more, if I could put it that way? Uh, absolutely so. When I was in Beijing uh, in the last weeks, a lot of officials um, uh, saw this as a form of economic containment, even that the Americans were, were pursuing mostly to uh, force China into a sort of uh, liberal trade uh, rules that would give American companies specifically more opportunities on the, the, the Chinese markets. Um, there were officials that went even further and that saw it as a, a deliberate attempt of Washington to sort of undermine its own efforts to weave the neighboring countries into uh, an economic network uh, around uh, the Chinese uh, Chinese markets. And I think that these concerns, these fears, were not just sort of diplomatic exaggeration, but that they were very genuine and that it also shows that in spite of having very strong interdependence across the Pacific, that um, it is seen from both sides as unbalanced. Chinese believes the, MS, uh, the U.S. Uh, benefits too much. Uh, Washington believes the Chinese uh, benefit too much. And that this is causing frictions, frictions that are politicized uh, and are going to lead to, uh, to more strains and difficulties in the future. All right, let's talk. Uh, let's move on to um, the other issue, that, uh, another one of the issues that we mentioned at the top of the program, this uh, territorial dispute over the South uh, China Sea. Scott Lucas, what's, what's really in play here? Is it, is it um, economic concerns? Is it trading routes? Is it, is it politics? Is it China trying to throw its weight around, as some would see it? I think it 
its basic level, as your guest in Hong Kong mentioned, it's a red line. Uh, China effectively is saying, in our backyard, uh, you know, you go this far and you go no farther. And that does bring in questions of economics. It brings in questions of territorial claims. But it's especially symbolic. That is, is the United States will try to project power throughout the region. That's, that's the nature of trying to be a superpower, even at a time of decline. China will watch that. I think China will respond primarily not by deliberately or not by directly confronting it militarily. But if the United States goes too far, if it tries to project power effectively right next to China, then Beijing has to act. And I think the signal you're getting right now from China is, look, you saw what happened 10 years ago when you had the incident where an American reconnaissance plane was brought down. You saw the tensions it brought. Don't bring it to that point again. Back off, in other words. And it'll be interesting to see if the Americans take that on board and if while carrying out this new defense strategy to deploy in different areas, especially throughout the Pacific, they don't cross that line. But uh, the United States, Scott Lucas, also has a lot of allies uh, in the region who have been calling on, the, on, on Washington uh, to show more leadership in, in the region as a buffer towards China. But leadership doesn't mean uh, military confrontation. Uh, leadership doesn't mean military provocation. Leadership means, for example, the nature of cooperation, building up mutual discussions. For example, the agreement this week where the Americans are going to put soldiers into Australia. Uh, and that's what we're talking about. The, the old Cold War framework was often a bilateral framework. That is, the U.S. would go to individual countries and say, look, let's give you military aid. Or it was to try to, to build up a, con, uh, a containing ring, say, like the Southeast Asian Treaty Organization. We're not in that world anymore. We're in the world of APAC and in Asian Pacific groupings. So even if countries in the region are saying to Americans, look, we don't want you too weak, I don't think they want them so strong that America is threatening Beijing. Jonathan Holslag, this uh, agreement between the United States and uh, Australia that was signed when uh, President Obama um, was there, uh, basically allowing for uh, U.S. troops uh, to be stationed in this base, this Australian base in Darwin. I mean, China obviously sees this as a provocation. Are they justified in feeling that way? Well, most um, uh, countries in the region are trying to hedge to keep the options open. We see um, Australia also to reach out the Chinese military uh, to explore some forms of exchanges, and that goes for most uh, other uh, powers in uh, in China's vicinity. The thing is, rather, that we are probably just at the beginning of uh, a marked military power shift in the region, and that it still remains to be seen how the next steps of those countries uh, are going to be if China continues to uh, show its prowess uh, more from its uh, its its uh, or original uh, security parameter and I think that in some ways there is a sort of geopolitical zero-sum game uh, going on between the US particularly and and China as much as the Americans are inclined to stick their security parameter traditional security parameter as close to the Eurasian continent as possible a much uh, as much China has an inclination to try to break through it because it's not only a matter of having the Americans balancing against uh, its rise it's also a matter of having its key interest, the, the unification with Taiwan, its territorial claims over the, the, the South China Sea, being compromised by uh, this, uh, this American supremacy. It's not just static balancing. Uh, I think, uh, again, there is a risk for escalation and more um, uh, fierce tensions in, uh, in the future. Simon Shen, when all of the dust has settled over, over uh, what's happened over the last week, um, with the Obama's uh, Asian trip and, and the various agreements that have been signed and, and some of the things uh, that he said. How will China in the long term come to view this? Well, uh, there are a few options. Um, one option assumes that as, as long as China is rising, then uh, the world cannot ignore China, and then uh, the labors of China cannot ignore China, and then uh, it would do them no good if they are siding with the states. So uh, we don't have to respond, and that's plan number one. Plan number two is to re-engage the United States. For instance, uh, the China can try its best to join the TPP so that it can um, do whatever they want within the same framework and then to dismiss the U.S. intention, and that's plan B. And the third plan is that um, China can do something as soon as possible to kind of balance the U.S., for instance, simply by uh, declaring its um, sovereignty over some of the uh, controversial islands and then to send some troops to occupy some of the symbolic islands so that um, the strategy of China can be shifted from defensive to offensive, from passive to active. And then I think all of the plans are being discussed in Beijing right now, and we haven't have any conclusion yet.
But do you leave, do you believe that uh, China this time has um, seen the need perhaps for uh, a more conciliatory approach? Well, uh, the official terminology is uh, peaceful rise and peaceful development. But uh, in the public, uh, in China, there was always a demand that peaceful has to have some limitation. Uh, if the other side is being too provocative, then we have to do something to kind of balance. And then this kind of views is uh, having more and more support. So I, I think in the long run, if the U.S. is seen as being intentionally provocative to um, the sovereignty of China, then eventually there would be some uh, hardcore responses, and then the likely scenario would be in the South China Sea. Indeed, we should pay attention to the fact that uh, Hillary Clinton have used the term Western Philippine Sea instead of South China Sea to refer to that region, and that is particularly unacceptable uh, to most of the Chinese population. Scott Lucas, do you fear that uh, the United States, uh, with, with this new approach or this attempt to, to, to uh, re-establish their influence in the region, do you fear that they've uh, basically rubbed China the wrong way here? I think it remains to be seen. Uh, I think right now, if the Americans are posing, if they're basically trying to, to act tough, but if at the end of the day they realize that, in fact, look, the big game in town is economics, the big game in town is regional security, and you don't benefit on either of those games by provoking the Chinese, then I think we're going to see this as a blip and we'll see basically discussions, what Hillary Clinton might have called a reset with Russia. You have a reset with Beijing. If the Americans, however, are not just posing, if they seriously think that they want to basically push the Chinese back in terms of projecting military power, if they are seriously talking about not just one but more than one economic system in Asia where the U.S. calls up its allies and China calls up its allies, then we do have a serious issue. My hope right now is, is that the realistic heads in Washington will realize posing goes so far and that they'll stop. All right, just uh, in the three minutes or so that we have left, uh, Jonathan Holtz, like, how do you see this uh, playing out then over the next uh, weeks and months? As it was a lot of what we heard over the last week, uh, a bluster, and that uh, basically uh, as time goes on, cooler heads will prevail? Well, Chinese leaders uh, certainly try to stick to their line of peaceful development. And I think when it's up to the White House, they will also try to sort of re-stabilize relations. But the current uh, maneuvering and muscle flexing of the U.S. is having a disastrous impact on uh, the Chinese public perceptions of America's role in, uh, in the region. And in the long run, especially with the political transition in China coming up, is going to reduce significantly the maneuverability of China's political bosses to stick to a conciliatory line a forthcoming line towards uh, Washington will have an impact on all sorts of issues ranging from economics over diplomacy to military affairs. Uh, I think we should be very careful and not be too confident in the trend of regional uh, integration and cooperation that we have uh, witnessed in the last decades or so. Simon Shen, some, people, some analysts have viewed this as perhaps a, a message to China that it hasn't really been good enough uh, when it comes to diplomacy uh, with its neighboring countries in the, in the region. Do you see it that way? Uh, well, uh, it's true that there is a strong sense of um, China threat theory uh, among the Southeast Asian countries, and then they are quite skeptical against the rise of China, which is quite true. Uh, however, uh, I think at the same time, they also don't wish to see uh, the uh, evidence presence of the United States in the region. They just wish to uh, have their own uh, independence against uh, the superpowers. So uh, right now, um, there seems to be a very interesting balance of power. On one hand, they lead um, both China and the states uh, economically and strategically, but on the other hand, they wish themselves to uh, counterbalance one another. So I think uh, if properly managed, uh, the Southeast Asian countries can act as a buffer zone between the two uh, superpowers, and then uh, they can even harmonize the U.S. relations, and that would be the best scenario out of everything. So just to sum up then, Scott Lucas, I'll, I'll give you the last word on this. How do you see this uh, playing out over the next few weeks and months? I think we're going to see a lot of posturing. I think we'll see uh, can some muscle flexing, but I think it'll be in terms of rhetoric. I think once we talk a few months from now, despite the American election, despite issues of nationalism in China, you're going to see diplomacy and you're going to see economics prevail. And, uh, and you'll see basically this competitive cooperation, which has really been the watchword for U.S.-Chinese relations over the past decade. All right, that is going to have to be the last word. We're out of time. I want to thank all three of our guests, Scott Lucas in Birmingham, Jonathan Holslag in Brussels, and Simon Shen in Hong Kong. Many thanks for your time.
And that's it for this edition of Inside Story. Remember, you can also join the conversation online with your views on this topic and any other story for that matter. Just send them to us at InsideStory at aljazeera.net. I'm Hazem Seeker. The latest news is up next. We'll see you next time.